All right, today it's the super business day, right? This is the business, five years and counting. Yes, today is the super mega turbo, turbo building muscle on keto, right? That's what you guys want. So let's talk about keto for athletes. Now this is very interesting. So a lot of athletes we presume as We always presume that athletes are very healthy, but a lot of them are not because they don't allow their bodies to recover in enough time. When you're young, it's fine because you can push your adrenals to the freaking limit and still be a workhorse as an athlete. But over time, your systems start to not function as fabulous as they once did when you were young. That's why I'm always talking about happy freaking genetics, y'all, because this is not genetics. No, this is what I've done with my genetics, which is epigenetics. So I used to be a pro skateboarder. I busted my knee. I've had 10 surgeries in a four year period was on crutches for most of those four years. I got sick of surgeries. I need uh, probably one or two more. And here I am today. I worked real hard to build muscle everywhere. No cardio. I do no cardio. So here's what's interesting, right? So I'm at the gym. 47, going on 48, soon to be 50, and I'm doing leg extensions with baby ass weight because my knee is destroyed. People are like, oh, so you're fine now? I'm like, no, 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 no. No, the day that my knee was like hanging like this with nothing attached except skin uh, is better than what it is. It was better then that day than what it is now because I have so much inflammation in my joint but yet and still I'm able to get the business because I understand what it takes. So you have these like kind of classification of athletes. You've got people or people who are fit. You got people who believe in the no pain, no gain, and they just literally drive their freaking body to the ground. Now what's very interesting about these types are like the adrenaline junkies like me as a pro skateboarder on those big vert ramps. The interesting thing is, you have endorphins, yes, and they crack lack. You get that boom, that serotonin bump, that sense of euphoria. And we need that because that's reparative. But then at the same time, your body has like a limit and you push the limit. And your body's like, dude, yo, okay, I've got this much energy and this much power, but I need to conserve energy at the same time and you're not giving my body a break. So I start to see inflammation on athletes. So I was talking to, so okay, so I was looking at a girl when I was in the gym. I was talking to another girl. I'm having this conversation with these women who are trying to be fit. So one was in her early 20s and she was just, you know, burpees and freaking like boo, 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 high knees and like push ups and like she wasn't giving herself a break. And it's like, all right, her adrenal glands are being freaking pushed to the limit. Now, 22, you can't notice because your cells are stronger, right? So you don't see the effect from that abuse as much. But as soon as you start getting older, you start to see inflammation really in the face. It starts to be puffy. Um, you don't look rested. Your skin quality is just all rashed out or like. <sighs> and she didn't have the same lean body mass as I do. Yeah, this is, this is me. Probably around 2,000 calories at this point. 
Yeah. And no, uh, calories do not matter. That's a whole nother subject, another video. But let's get right on to it. So, you overstimulate your adrenal glands and uh, you don't eat really clean as an athlete. I mean, you have maybe more efficient fat cells than the average Joe or Cindy or Latoya. But uh, at the end of the day, you can start to see inflammation anyway appear on the skin. And over time, these youngsters that are athletes, when they start to get older, now you have anomalies that are in the 40s, and you're like, oh, this guy's in his 40s, and he eats whatever, and he looks fantabulous. But these are anomalies, and we don't know what their lives were. We don't know what their parents ate or the quality of the father's sperm to understand why this anomaly could eat so poorly and still look shredded. But what's going on on the inside, you know? The visceral fat around the organs because I could be this ripped and be a facade and could have visceral fat growing within my body but I'm just taking stuff and I'm doing some drugs and I'm just sort of like um, taking some vitamins <laughs> some supplements um, and work my body to the bone and have this fake appearance of being healthy so a lot of you guys, if you really want to see if somebody's cheating or not, look at the face because the face is going to tell you a lot. Yes, you've got like, you've got intestines, you've got the digestive system in this area, you've got the kidneys. There's a lot of little roadmaps to your face that are directly connected to the quality of your organs. So those people who appear to be athletes really look at their face because you can start to see the damage within their body that we cannot see on the external body that we're looking at and we're so external to society we're very superficial and we don't know how to dig deeper like does someone look tired are they too dry in the skin are they not getting enough fat because a lot of people who low fat they look very dry their skin just doesn't look right their hair doesn't look right. But let's get back onto it. What I've learned is that if you lift weight, then, uh, yeah, your protein demand can be higher than the average Joe. But even, because uh, really being in a highly adapted keto state is so amazeballs. It's so fantastical that the protein sparing effect is no joke. Like reading Steve Finney and Jeff Bullock's book, books, uh, it's amazing the actual concept of protein sparing effect, that you have less of a gluconeogenic effect, meaning your muscles aren't breaking down as fast to convert into glucose because, you know, when athletes go out and exercise, at some point your muscles are empty from energy, so everybody thinks that their body taps into fat, but it doesn't because muscle is too expensive when you're there's no fuel in the gas tank fuel is food so if uh, your gas tank or glucose if your glucose your glycogen is low then your body would rather take muscle which is burning too much anyway get rid of it and convert it into sugar and kind of put that back into fat in case there's famine you've got a lot of fat to survive on that's the primal thing that we can't do anything about so people out there um, who are athletes have the benefits of having this euphoria and the dopamine response and the serotonin bump, but then at the same time, their digestive systems tend to be, a lot of people tend to be constipated, especially long distance runners. People are asking me about you know, endurance athletes and if it's good for them. Well, of course ketogenesis, keto is good for uh, in, endurance athletes, but the reality is, First, you got to get yourself highly adapted. To become highly adapted, you've got to run less. And you've got to train less, right? You've got to get your adrenal glands to start functioning more properly. Kind of stop acting so slow to not over-secrete cortisol and adrenaline. And then you have to get rest, of course. So you've got to be in this reparative zone. But if you can start to kind of heal your systems, then 
Once you're adapted and by using a glucometer, you can find out exactly that, that uh, carb limit that you would need to be able to get enough glucose into the body as a runner because um, ultimately, some, sometimes, not ultimately, those two words don't mix, they don't mix, but runners tend to use both. They use glucose and they use ketones. Now, unfortunately, training to be a runner is too catabolic and it's very difficult to be strictly ketones as a marathoner running these like ultra marathons and that's why they find exactly they may not be in nutritional ketosis where you're just fully adapted but they can be on a low level ketosis where they don't bonk and hit that wall because there's still ketones going into the body but there's enough glucose get into the body to not have this weird reaction of insulin resistance which is quite interesting because your muscles can shut down and not allowed, allow glucose to be stored as glycogen and um, you start to notice that your glucose numbers are too high and that's your body's and your brain's attempt to bring back, get glucose and glycogen storage is up so the brain can get that glucose. Now when you're living a ketogenic life and you're not a marathoner then you don't need those two fuel sources which puts you in a real purgatory zone because you're not highly keto adapted and the benefits of being highly adapted are just like superhuman. I mean, your energy, the lack of hunger, your body repairs. So as an athlete, it's not always healthy to overstimulate your adrenal glands. But if you're going to be an, a marathoner, an endurance athlete, then becoming highly adapted first and getting your brain to understand ketones and beta hydroxybutyrate would be great. So then when you actually find your carb tolerant level, you can add carbs and still create enough ketones to get you through your marathon or whatever you're doing. But you will not have, you will not have the high benefits of um, being highly keto adapted. Now for lifters who are worried about losing strength, you don't lose strength being highly adapted. You, you lose the ability to beat somebody in a 100 meter sprint. Yes, because a person who's doing a 100 meter sprint has full glycogen storages, hopefully, and they've got rocket fuel. Now, ketones don't work like rocket fuel. They're the type of fuel that's gonna burn even all day long, and you're gonna be ripe, and you're gonna be good, and you're gonna be amazing. You're gonna be like, yeah, I feel great, and that gives your body a chance to heal, and your muscles to grow because your muscles can start to use ketones as well. So you can get strong. I'm strong. And as you can see, my pump is back. Your body, when you eat carbohydrates, for every bite of a carb, your body holds on to almost three bites of water in the cells like they're there. So you're kind of bloated. And then your body, when you drop out the carbohydrates real low, if you went down to 15 grams, you're gonna drop a lot of water you drop a lot of water, your electrolyte balance is off. So your sodium, potassium, magnesium levels are all over the place. And sometimes people get the keto flu headache, a dull headache, which I'm like, go take a glass of water with a fourth of a teaspoon or half a teaspoon of sodium, Himalayan or, or Celtic, Celtic, whatever. Put it in the water, start, drink it, boom. Okay, you need magnesium definitely as an athlete. So unfortunately our soil is quite depleted so it's very hard to get magnesium without supplementation or what the bone broth soup that's cooking in my kitchen all right yes as an athlete once your body and your kidneys know how to rebalance the water you're not dumping as fast and then all of a sudden that pump that rush of blood to the muscle it comes back it comes back like crazy and you get bubbly and you get nice muscle shape on keto but you have to get through that period of your body trying to adjust or else people are freaking out that they're flat. Now, when you first try keto as a lifter, people are worried about uh, losing muscle because they're not keto adapted. Now, if you lift and you sleep well and you cut out the damn caffeine and foods that might create an allergy and uh, foods that are, have, have allergens like casein and, and phytic acids, if you cut those out and you clean up your diet and get super gnarly amazing rest, that whole catabolic